There's more by-elections in the last 17 months than we have had to face in the last 17 years. Street demonstrations have become more prevalent. Public has become more cynical. Criticisms continue to demonize the very pillars and institutions of nation building. The monarchy, the judicial system, the police, parliament, senate, and state assemblies, cabinet, civil service, and state governments. In short, local and the international, domestic and the foreign, from gigantic transnational capital flows and human migration to a new global and national political debate to suicide bombings, we suddenly find ourselves caught up in a reality to an extent that we have not begun to really appreciate. So if you ask, you, if you, if you ask me, how now? What are we to do? My simple answer would be, no worries. <laughs> it will be difficult. It will be hard. Managing change has always been difficult. But not something that we as a nation have not faced or gone through before. We had to unite when we wanted our independence. We had to navigate a new landscape after the tragedy of 13 May 1969. We had to see and work out our own formula to win the hearts and minds of the public when we face the communists and when we confront our seats. The economic crisis from Asian dragons and drivers to economic basket cases in the 90s. In fact, in fact these are exciting times we live in. Before us, is a healthy and more vibrant landscape. Our white canvas will be painted the way we want our country to be. The kids, that is how mentioned earlier, is really like the white cloth that needs to be painted with the colors that is going to be the future of the nation. It's their innocence and how we mold that innocence will determine whether what we aim and dream for will ever become a reality. Business cannot be as usual. We would have to make fresh, credible, bold, but at the same time doable and often difficult policy decisions. But if we get it right, then we would probably be ensuring the stability, security, unity and harmony of future generations for at least the next 50 years. No. Which now brings me neatly to our topic today, racial integration and its challenges. A topic at the heart of all the nations, and one that is very close to me personally, being the grandson of Dr. Horn, who wanted to open UMNO to all races, and as the son of the Hussein, as Rashan, or Rame, sorry, said earlier, Papa, the Paduan. In this respect, I personally continue to dream for a more united Malaysia, and I continue to hold on to that dream. Unfortunately, with what I've said earlier as a backdrop, I must admit integration is becoming much more difficult and full of challenges. For example, even in education in schools, a place in which Malaysians place their hopes for a brighter future for their children can easily become a place of which we can be most emotional. It can be easily become contested territory. On the issue of language, for example, we have twin multilingualism and mother tongue, the preservation of indigenous and ethnic languages, and the position of Bahas and Malaysia could easily turn ugly for the world to see. The decision to teach science and mathematics in English can easily raise heated cultural and ethnic linguistic defenses. Communal conflicts and tensions are being expressed in arguments about our schools, our curriculum, and our teachers. Hence, 
My reply to the topic given to me today is simply this, that Malaysia's greatest challenge as a dependence, our diversity, 52 years later, is still our greatest challenge. Today, we have still not come to appreciate the value of national and cultural diversity as a strength. Today, we have still not begun to think of our multiracialism beyond just a compromise. We have yet to see it as an exciting invitation to work together and to create a unique society together. Today, we still see it merely as a contract to live and let live. We continue to be defensive of our diversity, and we continue to only see potential sensitivities and pitfalls. We are not proud of it, nor do we teach our children to see the opportunity to benefit from it make capital out of it and leverage it. This has to change. And today, 52 years on, at a turning point in our history, faced with many new challenges, we have to decide how to move forward. This is where the leadership of Dr. Sri Najib as our new Prime Minister is so important. I submit Satu Malaysia, Rakyat Bidahudukan, Prestasi diutamakan at this point in time is crucial if not critical. The concept of one Malaysia pillared on three main trusts. Firstly, comprehensive acceptance as opposed to mere tolerance. Secondly, nationhood as opposed to many different pockets of nations within a nation. And finally, social justice for all, irrespective of color religion and background based on a strong sense of justice and fairness must not fail. The government must perform. One Malaysia, people first, performance now, must be translated into something the public sees and more impor importantly, the public feels. When Dr. Sri Najib took office, he was conscious to the fact that this government could no longer work in the old environment with the old mindsets. That the government had to focus on what the Malaysian public cared the most. And as Prime Minister, he had to keep his government focused on these priorities. He had to immediately make fresh but often difficult policy decisions. His government had to be seen to be fair to all. One that needed to walk the talk able to make bold but at the same time doable decisions. Otherwise, three years down the road, the vision will remain only a concept and we face to a then at our peril. Our PM did not waste any time. In his maiden speech on the 3rd of April, he announced the release of 13 ISA detainees, lifted the ban on opposition papers and announced the review of the ISA. He then announced the liberalization of 27 subsectors in the services sector followed by the financial services sector. He introduced two stimulus packages amounting to 67 billion ringgit, together with a website to track the implementation. 13 more ISA detainees, including Hindu drug leaders, were released. KPIs were set for ministers. Scope of Bermuda in the civil service to assist the public delivery system was expanded and the FIC guidelines were also liberalized. On the 11th of July, only three months since his maiden speech on his 100th day speech, he made 11 announcements ranging from toll rates, public housing, licenses for hawkers and petty traders, taxi permits, road, water, and message electricity in Sabah and Sarawak to the increase in the allocation for the food to the amount of $115 million, $15 million specific, specifically for entrepreneurs from the Indian community, and a new Amanaka Hub, one Malaysia worth $10 million. On the 17th of July, 16 days later, he announced details of the six key results ranging from reducing crime, widening access to affordable and quality education, 
improving infrastructural and rural areas and finally improving um, public transportation.